Hi guys, I'm Phoebe and I write fiction. Welcome to my channel where I talk about all things to do with making stories. Getting the right feedback on your writing is like gold dust. Sometimes you've fixed everything that you can see to fix with your work and you know there's probably more stuff you're not seeing, but you, you don't see it. And then someone comes along, some angelic being, and they can see the things you can't see and it is like magic. But getting feedback and critiques can also be scary because you don't know if you're gonna get the kind of critique you want or apply it correctly or maybe you're just gonna be refreshing your email every second for two months because you need the feedback now and you don't know when it's coming. So this is gonna be a video chatting about receiving feedback, applying critiques and handling rejection. We're talking about this subject matter because there is in fact a new opportunity to find a critique partner if that's something you're interested in. Meredith Phillips has created a critique partner matchup open to any writer over the age of 18, any level of writing experience in any genre where you'll be able to get some critique on your writing. It's open for the foreseeable future so there isn't a rush to sign up and I think it's a pretty great idea because critique is important. All of the details are going to be in Meredith's video which I will hopefully have linked down below. Let's, let's chat about the whole receiving critique thing. I I'm going to open up the concept of feedback a little bit wider than just receiving critiques from a critique partner. For example, I often receive feedback in the form of emails from magazine editors when I've submitted my short stories to them and it's a very similar feeling. So I thought I might as well just roll that all together. And as usual, I am not coming to you guys as an expert, a guru. This is not really me telling you how to do anything so much as talking about my own experience and just stuff that I feel that's useful to think about but if you have differing opinions feel free to talk about it down in the comments and we're we're opening up a discussion more than me preaching to you like some kind of teacher because who am I honestly. I've exchanged stuff with friends since childhood and then I did a degree in literature with creative writing so I did formal workshops where we critiqued each other's work as classes I've been in critique groups online and now, as I said, it's more this, m most of my feedback at the moment is from sending short stories out and then editors of magazines going, oh, so close, but we're not gonna take it because of X, Y, Z. And then they give me a few lovely paragraphs of feedback, which is actually amazing. And so that's why I'm gonna talk about handling rejection a little bit because in those instances, for me, the feedback comes with a rejection attached but also I think that a critique even from a critique partner if it's very detailed and thorough it can actually feel a little bit like a rejection because someone's listing off all of this stuff about your work that doesn't work and although you know that's to try and make it better it can feel like a rejection of your work or even a rejection of you as a person. I think the process of handling a critique well and receiving critique, that process starts before you even get the critique. So let's say you've been matched up with a partner through Meredith's critique partner matchup system. The ultimate thing here is clear communication of intent. So what you're looking to get from the critique. So it's helpful for your partner to know what stage of the process you're at, first draft versus you know, polished draft that you're just cleaning up and what style of feedback you want because it is legitimate to be on an early draft of something and to just want cheerleading and to just want someone to brainstorm ideas with you and chat about stuff and you're enthused about the characters and you want to share them and that helps you write and that could be a thing that you want. It's also in many cases legitimate that you've been trying to edit this for a long time you can no longer see what needs doing and so you need someone to really dive in and get into the depths of the problems with it. It's important that your partner knows what you need otherwise you might get something different at the end of the process and be disappointed with your critique. I for example know that although I definitely want to hear what's wrong with the piece because how else am I going to improve it, I also need to know what's working because my personal tendency is to overcorrect errors. So if someone says something's wrong with my work, I will chuck out the whole story and start from scratch instead of, you know, just fixing like the one scene that actually needs fixing. And so 
it helps me when people tell me what works because then I'm less likely to just chuck it away and I'll actually keep what's working and just fix what's not working. I also think it's helpful if part of this clear communication is setting a time frame for the critique. And a little bit later I'll talk about exactly why that is so helpful. If you're expecting to receive email feedback of any kind, whether it's from a critique partner or a publisher of some kind or agent of some kind, I would personally think about whether you want to have a separate writing email address. Because I think there's two ways to think of this. When I was first sending out short stories, I was worried that receiving the feedback and rejections would be demoralizing. I wanted to not be taken off guard by that just coming into my email and, you know, I'm having a good day and then suddenly there's a rejection, I feel awful. And so I made a separate email account just for those submissions so that I could only check it when I wanted to. And so I knew I'd be in the right mental space to check it. Alternatively, you could be someone where you think, well, if I have this set called email address, it's inconvenient. And also I'm just gonna be re repeatedly checking it. Whereas if it comes into my normal email address, I know I don't have to go and check it. So I can just stop thinking about it and let it come in when it comes in. You know, whatever works for you. During the critique, as in, whilst your work is away with someone else getting feedback, I personally like to think about it as little as possible. So this means trying not to partake in what we would call in the short story world, we would call it rejectomancy, which is where based on how long your story has been at a certain magazine and who else they've rejected and what they have or haven't emailed you, you try to guess what their response is going to be. And I think the same thing happens with critique partners, where based on what email they did or didn't see send you or how long it's been since you heard from them, you start to think, oh my God, they hate this bit. I bet they're thinking about how that bit, blah, blah, blah. And oh, I've just realized such and such. And the thing is, you'll know when you know. You'll know what their feedback is when you get it. And it's really helpful to start trying to guess, especially based on very subtle clues about when they have or haven't emailed you, what they're thinking. They'll tell you what they're thinking when they tell you what they're thinking. Let's not try and guess in the meantime. And it's easier to be doing this if, as I said earlier, you know the time frame that you're expecting to get your critique in. So if you were expecting to get a critique response in March, because that's what you agreed with your partner, you don't have to worry about it in January, in February. You can put it completely out of mind. You don't need to check your emails. You don't need to prompt anyone for their response. You can just assume when it's coming in. And of course, the best distraction of all could be writing a completely different project. Uh, when I've sent something out the door, I want to be working on something else. Part of that is just because I'm always writing and it doesn't make sense to be writing on something that is already out the door getting a critique. So um, it has to be writing on something else. But I also think it's just, it's a good distraction and it means that if you do get a critique back that you find demoralizing, if it makes you question that other project and feel bad about that other project, well then you'll feel better because you've got this other new shiny project that you still feel great about. <laughs> As you can tell, a lot of this video is me thinking about how I emotionally handle critiques and feedback and rejection because honestly, I think mindset is sometimes one of the hardest things about writing. And for me, certainly, it's not the work or practicalities of getting a critique back and having to apply it that intimidates me. It's whether that critique is gonna make me feel bad about myself or the project. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys can relate. Uh, I really hope some of you can, otherwise this is a waste of time. <laughs> so you receive the critique. You see that email pop up in your inbox. You should probably decide whether now is a good time to read it or whether, again, you wanna leave it to be in the right mindset. Personally, I read stuff straight away because I'm curious and I'm itching to know and how could I possibly not know immediately? When you read it, you may find that you have an emotional response, as I've been saying, and it might be excitement. You might be thrilled about this stuff that's suddenly been in unlocked in your head. You just wanna start writing immediately. You wanna tell your critique partner exactly how amazing their feedback was, or it might be the opposite. You might be feeling angry, a little bit resentful, a little bit sad or disappointed or ashamed. And those things are all normal. And I think as writers, like anyone else, we have an ego and we pour a lot of ourselves into our work. So stuff that isn't personal 
about the writing can feel personal. What I like to do at this point is to, to sleep on it or to wait 24 hours. Sometimes I get feedback and I just feel fine and great about it. Sometimes I get feedback and it does hurt and it makes me question whether my writing is any good, whether I'm any good, whether I, you know, whether I deserve to exist. No, not that dramatic. And for me, I usually feel better the next day. That afternoon or evening after receiving the critique, I just kind of sit in that feeling and live with it and say, okay, I'm gonna feel better about this tomorrow. I know I will, because I always do. I always feel better tomorrow. You might have a similar thing. It might take you only an hour to recover or it might take you multiple days. So I like to not reply to an email from whoever's given me the critique until the next day when I know my emotions have settled. And there's no one in the world who's critiqued your writing who needs an immediate response from you. Like they can wait till the next day. It's, it's not urgent. Within 24 hours, I can go from feeling like really sad about feedback to being really excited because I've figured out that yes, it is correct. And yes, there are ways I can fix it. And I've started brainstorming what those are. So 24 hours for me makes a huge difference. You will almost certainly, I think, want to ask follow-up questions when you've had a good critique. So the way that I love to do this is that I take that 24 hours and I schedule to talk with the person who critiqued me like a week later. And then I have six days to brainstorm how I'm going to address the various things they pointed out about the story. So if they said, we don't know about this character, I'll be brainstorming the stuff that I want to add in about that character. If they say this plot point just seems to come out of nowhere, I'll brainstorm whether I want to take it out or whether I'm weaving more stuff in to set it up and to show how it connects to the next thing. And then a week later, I like to talk either in person or by video call. So the initial critique has probably been in writing, but I like to do this follow up by video call if possible. It's, it's just so much more helpful to be talking in the moment at that stage for me. I will basically list off to them all of the ideas I have about how I could address their suggestions for the piece and also just stuff that I'm not sure about yet. So I'll say, you know, you suggested that this could be different. Well, I'm thinking it could be this or it could be that or it could be this other thing, but I don't know. They get a chance to feed back to you and present you with more ideas or to say, actually, I think you've misinterpreted what I meant by my comment on that section or they can say yeah that sounds like a great fix or um no I don't think that fix would really address what I'm talking about or you could do this you could do that I just find it really helpful to have this second follow-up session where you can clarify everything you want to clarify there will sometimes be stuff in critique that you feel is an unfair critique of your work and if you are a little bit in your emotions still, or if that writer ego has been bruised, which we all have one, it's okay. It can be tempting to argue back against a critique. So someone says, maybe, I didn't find this character likable. And you want to say, well, this character is totally likable because later on you're gonna get a scene of their tragic backstory that will completely explain the way that they behave and you're gonna feel really sorry for them. So they're actually totally likable and you don't know what you're talking about. If you find yourself trying to have a debate with the person that critiqued you, you know, that may not be helpful. <laughs> I find that it's more helpful to ask questions than to start a debate. So the question might be, do you think this character would be more likable if you knew about this certain thing from their backstory? And if so, do you think I should move that further up in the story? Do you think I should move it earlier in the story so that you see that bit of their backstory before they do this thing that seems really unlikable? Like, would that fix it for you? Was it something else about them that seemed unlikable? You know, we're just, let's investigate the problem with questions rather than telling your critique partner they're wrong. You've asked for a subjective opinion because writing is subjective. There's, you know, there's grammar rules, but even those vary from country to country and also you can break them for stylistic reasons. And there is stuff that's, you know, styles, there are styles of writing that are objectively 
not commercial or not many people these days like to read them but it's a subjective thing overall especially when you're talking about the story content so to argue back against you, you've asked someone their subjective opinion and then they've given it and so you can't really say that it's wrong because that's their opinion it's like asking someone what their favorite ice cream is and they say strawberry and you say well no it isn't that's wrong you ask their opinion that they gave their opinion they can't give anyone else's opinion they can only give their subjective opinion and it's your choice whether you then apply that to the work or not but you don't need to have like some lengthy debate where you're like trying to win against them by proving one thing or another having said that everything is subjective there will be times when you're disappointed with a critique maybe and you just feel like it's not helpful maybe they have made objective errors where they've introduced grammatical problems or maybe they've just misunderstood what your work is about or what you were asking from them maybe you're writing a tense political thriller and they suggested you add a 300 word comedic rant about why penguins are the best animal in the middle of a you know intense climactic scene whatever it is you may just look at a critique and think uh, this is just not this hasn't helped <laughs> if that is the case my suggestion is as before, as always, you know, wait until your emotions settle from that and then just send a polite thank you email and don't, you know, pursue working with that person again. Don't ask for a critique from them in the future if you don't find it helpful. It is not necessary in your polite thank you email to list out all of the things that you felt were wrong <laughs> or incorrect about their critique because you have asked for a critique of your work but they have not asked for a critique of their critique. And ultimately it's probably not gonna be helpful, especially given this is someone that if you don't find their feedback helpful, you probably just don't want to go through the process with them. What are you uh, achieving by trying to like teach them how to critique better, you know? As I said, I, they do deserve a thank you because they have invested their time and energy. They probably gave you what they thought was a very helpful critique. It's unlikely that it was um, just malicious. I mean, occasionally you get a critiquer who fuels their own ego by just tearing down the work of others. And the only reason they enjoy critiquing is because kind of putting someone else's work down makes them feel better. I think that's a, like a minority, really a minority of critiquers. And again, if you do come across someone like that, the response is the same, polite thank you, and then just don't continue critiquing with them. If you have agreed to be critique partners where you both swapped work, obviously fulfill your end of the bargain and critique whatever you need to critique for them. If they're expecting you to continue with that relationship, you'll just have to send an email that says, um, I don't think we're the best match, or whatever. It's something polite. In the case of feedback that I've got from magazines, where it's obviously there's different etiquette surrounding it, the etiquette is usually not to reply to personalised rejections anyway. These are publications that get, you know, like a thousand emails a month, and they just don't need another 200 emails clogging up their inbox of people saying just thank you for the email. <laughs> it always feels rude to me when someone's sent like three to five paragraphs of detailed feedback on my story. I always want to send them an email to say thank you, but I'm pretty sure the preferred etiquette in the short story submission world is that unless you're getting an acceptance or a revise and resubmit, that you just don't respond to rejections because it is just gonna take up their time. <laughs> and another important thing to remember at this stage is that if you did get a critique that felt really harsh or demoralizing, this is not a sign that you should stop sending your work out. If the advice was helpful, then, you know, it's a sign that you should send your work out more and get even more of that amazing advice. In the case of rejections from magazines, like I sometimes get, I almost like to think of it as revenge. When I get rejected from a magazine, I think, well, in revenge for that, I'm gonna send you another story. The more you reject me, the more I will force you to continue reading my work. So, now you need to apply the critique. You don't have to apply all of it, you just have to apply the bits that you agree with. This is true with critique partners, this is true even with feedback from editors because they are thinking of how the story fits their particular publication or their particular tastes. And it could still be, a, or with literary agents, it could be a great story that doesn't meet their particular tastes. And that's okay, it just, so you don't have to fix everything. If you're not sure whether something's just a personal subjective opinion or whether it's a more objective issue with the piece, 
you can ask multiple people. That's always helpful. I think it's really important to stay true to the original vision of the piece, whatever that is. So sometimes a critique will feel like it's trying to sway away from what the purpose of the story was. So for example, you might get a critique that says, uh, add more romance, this really needs more romance. But maybe you weren't writing a romantic novel or maybe you're writing a really slow burn story where the characters don't even brush hands until book three. If that's the case, then your job as the writer is to make the reader desperately crave more romance, but not to give it to them. So getting that feedback that it needs more romance might actually be a sign that your slow burn is working well because you've made that reader crave it without actually drip feeding them very much of it at all. On the other hand, if you're trying to write an extremely romantic, heated story, then a comment that you need more romance is a, a good comment and you can say oh yeah where can I fit that in and you can apply it because it's very relevant to your original vision and it's keeping you on track with where you were trying to go. Obviously another thing to think about while applying critique is not to be me and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater i.e. recognise what is working in your writing and don't chuck that out along with whatever's not working. So those are some of my thoughts and suggestions, but also I'm not an expert, I'm just a person. Take all of this with a pinch of salt. Let me know in the comments if you disagree or you have additional thoughts, which I'm sure you definitely will. And if all of this has got you in the mood to get some amazing critique, then you must check out Meredith's video with all of the details of the Critique Partner matchup. And there's no deadline at the moment on when it's gonna close, so you can take your time easing on into that process. It was lovely chatting with you today, and I'll see you next time for another video about writing. Bye.